So taking a break from purely metal records for today's video, rather I'm going to be talking about 10 horror movie soundtracks from my vinyl collection. I'm going to talk about their respective movies, we're going to talk about the tracks a little bit, and of course I'm going to show some vinyl, because you know that's what I do, so definitely stick around. <laughs> So right away, you might be asking yourself, why is Matt talking about horror movie soundtracks on an otherwise metal vinyl channel? Well, it's not too hard to figure out. I think first and foremost, a lot of us metal fans love our horror movies, love them dearly. I think it's reflected a lot in not only the albums we listen to, but as band guys, the albums we make, um, considering that musicians, metal musicians are also fans. Uh, you see it in the album art, you see it in the lyrics, you see it in some movie samples that happen, horror movie samples, um, as well as the music in general. I mean, the music is dark, it's foreboding, uh, music in horror soundtracks is also that quite a bit often. Um, there is an overlap there, I think, in theatricality, but also in, again, that dark foreboding mood and tension which horror movies rely on, which other bands and their music rely upon too. There is quite a bit of overlap, and I think it's pretty relevant. I will say that the horror movie soundtracks I'm going to show you here don't have any metal on them whatsoever. There are heavy metal horror soundtracks out there. Uh, Trick or Treat comes to mind, uh, Black Roses, there are a bunch of those out there. Um, we are going to talk about stuff that's a little more orchestral, a little more symphonic. And I do want to bring that up in relation to heavy metal because those elements aren't strangers to the genre either. You have symphonic black metal, you have symphonic power metal, even symphonic traditional metal. And the symphonic elements are often used, again, in that dark, foreboding, tension-building way. So again, more overlap. So if you love horror, or you're just wanting to get into the Halloween spirit, regardless of what time of the year it is, or maybe you just want something different in your vinyl collection, you should definitely stick around. I'll be discussing the movies quite a bit, my experiences with them, how I discover them, that kind of thing, as well as the soundtracks and their appeal to horror fans. So let's get to it. So let's talk about Ghoulies, 1985. Uh, basically, a guy and a girl move into an inherited mansion. The guy gets a little obsessed with the occult history of the house, ends up in a ritual raising the ex-cult leader who lived in that house, along with all of his little creature minions, and then all hell breaks loose. Pretty simple plot, pretty enjoyable, very B-movie. So naturally, I loved this movie as a kid. I was probably about 16 or 17 when it came out. Obviously, this was a VHS rental. I didn't see it in the theaters. Um, has quite a few flaws in it. It is a B movie in a lot of senses. Um, most of the movie holds up still. I still think that the dinner scene and the scene where the kids get picked off one by one is a little slow, a little draggy. But then the ritual at the end picks it back up. So overall, it's still kind of hangs in there for me. Uh, Michael DeBar is the evil cult leader. He's amazing. He chews up scenery like nobody's business. Um, he's worth the price of admission alone. Um, he does have the title of Marquis, by the way, uh, Michael DeBar. Um, I don't know if that's French royalty or what the hell that is, but it's on his Wikipedia page. I found it elsewhere, so that's pretty interesting. Of course, this movie is tying into the popularity of the movie Gremlins and this whole start of the Little Creatures horror movie trend that happened. We had uh, Hobgoblins, we had Munchies, we had uh, Troll and The Gate and uh, Critters. There were a whole bunch of these types of movies that started off after Gremlins. I think people watched Gremlins and went, well, that's not 100% serious horror, so let's just make a horror movie for real, but with little tiny creatures. So that's what happened. It was a bit of a trend, and Ghoulies kind of came on the ground floor of that right after Gremlins. So there you are. As for the soundtrack, it is composed by Richard Band. Richard Band is very well known for uh, composing a lot of the Stuart Gordon films. Think Reanimator, think From Beyond, Castle Freak, all that stuff. His style is very uh, familiar. Um, he does cop a little bit from Bernard Herrmann, who did Psycho and a bunch of Hitchcock soundtracks. So you hear some similarities there. You do hear similarities of Richard Band's soundtracks from one to the other, though. So when you're listening to the Ghoulie soundtrack, watching the movie... You can hear a little bit of Reanimator. You can hear a little bit of From Beyond. So there's that. One thing I do love about the soundtrack, or we're going to see it in a minute, is that it plays it straight. Um, you know, there's a lot of goofiness going on in this movie, and you would think the music would be goofy, goofy, but it's not. It, it, again, the soundtrack is a very straight horror soundtrack for the most part. Um, there are some playful moments with woodwinds and stuff like that, but most of the soundtrack does have a sort of dark element to it, which I think is interesting. I think it sets an interesting mood, 
even though, of course, there's some goofiness in this movie, obviously. So here's the soundtrack, uh, released in 2020, uh, first time on vinyl. It might be first time on any format, actually. Uh, a lot of these soundtracks of these movies weren't officially released on soundtracks back when they were new. So pretty fun. Uh, cool gate fold here with pictures from the movie, including a great shot of Michael DeBar as the cult leader and this amazing tongue. Uh, notes by Richard Band, the composer I had mentioned. Uh, pretty cool. The tagline is, they'll get you in the end, which is fun because Ghoulies 2's tagline is, they'll get you in the end again. And it's obviously in relation to this toilet here. Very fun. So here's the vinyl, 180 gram vicious pink vinyl. Sure, why not? Uh, cool thing about this uh, record is that at the end of side B, there is a locked groove. If you don't know about locked grooves, locked grooves, uh, usually they're at the end right before the runoff, it, and they rarely appear on records. It's kind of a novelty thing. You have to position the needle very specifically to get into the locked groove because you won't naturally get to it by listening to the side from beginning to end. The locked groove on the end of side B here has the audio to the trailer for the movie, which is pretty fun. And again, you have to find it. It's also not listed on the album jacket, so you have to kind of know it's there, but it's definitely there. The soundtrack also comes with an additional 7-inch record. It's got a track on each side uh, from Fela Johnson, whoever the hell that is. Uh, Dancing with the Monster, or Dancing with a Monster, rather, is on the A side, and Surrender is on the B side. No, not the Cheap Trick song. Uh, basically, these songs are funky pop dance tracks. Uh, I think they're played in the background in some scenes in the movie, but in case you needed that, it's right here. So the Ghoulies soundtrack. And always remember, they'll get you in the end. Next up is Pieces 1982 Classic Gore Fest. Love this movie. I have tons of friends who worship at the temple of this movie, watch it every single Halloween 10 zillion times. It's really one of those movies. Uh, the basic synopsis here is that college co-eds are being picked off one by one by a crazed killer. But the fun part is that the killer is collecting one body part from each victim to create a human jigsaw puzzle, because why not? So definitely saw this as a kid on VHS, probably in the mid-80s. Um, I got into a lot of slasher films by this time. I had been watching horror movies, real horror movies, since probably about 1982, the year this movie came out, but obviously I didn't see this in 1982. This is a European film, I should also mention. It's not very American horror by any stretch. Uh, American horror movies at that time were a little safe. You know, they were playing by the MPAA rules, um, all that kind of stuff. But this movie doesn't, and that's what made it really cool. This movie also has a really sick and grimy feel to it. It really has that sort of indie Euro kind of sleaze horror thing going for it. I really loved that as a kid. This might have been one of the first movies I saw that was like this, and I definitely went out and sought more of this because once you get a taste of it, you want more. So, of course, this also has a really great shocker ending. Uh, you find out about the human jigsaw puzzle. By the way, spoiler alert. Uh, but, you know, it's called Pieces, and the box art kind of gives away some of that anyway. So it's not really a big secret. Uh, definitely love the ending. I love the WTF endings to movies. Uh, Sleepaway Camp has a rather obvious one that's pretty messed up, too. Love that stuff. I love when horror does that. As for the soundtrack, it is a bit of Goblin worship. Goblin, of course, is the 70s Italian prog band that scored a lot of Dario Argento's films. Um, I believe there's a little bit of pilfering here happening as well. Uh, speaking of pilfering, uh, the actual tracks on the soundtrack are pulled from other Italian movies, horror or otherwise. So that's kind of interesting. Um, the soundtrack here is definitely proggy and funky at times. Uh, there's some jazzy bits, but also some cool atmospherics and some synth effects. And I think once you get into that atmospheric synth stuff, the soundtrack is way more effective. It's way darker, it's creepier, and there is a little bit of repetition with uh, themes. There, there are variations on a theme in that regard, but still effective, still works. There's cover to the soundtrack, uh, minimalist art. Definitely dig it. He's got a little bit of a Freddy Krueger thing going on there, which is totally not in the movie whatsoever. Uh, track listing for you. Definitely in Italian, because Italians were partially responsible for making this movie. There it is. So here's the vinyl, classic black. Uh, this came out in 2015. This is the first time on the format, much like Ghoulies. Uh, there's track one, side one rather, and there's side two. 450 uh, copies released. 
pretty fun. Also, there's some uh, fun stuff going on in the runout. Uh, the A side says, bastard, 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 which is a great line in the movie. And then the, the other side says, um, oh, it's the line about uh, there's nothing better than uh, smoking pot and f***ing on a waterbed at the same time. I can't remember the exact quote, and I can't obviously see it from here, but it's all in there, definitely. So the pieces soundtrack, uh, great taglines. You can either pick from, you don't have to go to Texas for a chainsaw massacre, or the better one, it's exactly what you think it is. Next up is Hellbound, Hellraiser 2, came out in 1988. Basic synopsis is that Kirsty from the first movie is now institutionalized, and the hospital says this occult-obsessed doctor who resurrects Julia for some reason, and then the two of them resurrect the Cenobites, and then the horror starts all over again, because that's what a sequel has to do. So I definitely like this movie. Um, I might like the first Hellraiser a bit more than this one, though I like the soundtrack on this movie more than the first soundtrack. Christopher Young does a great job. He really outdoes himself. He's the composer, by the way. Um, there's definitely a sort of sinister and epic edge to a lot of his music. I think it was a little bit more in Hellraiser and not as much in this one. There's a little more variance in this soundtrack, but still great. Here's the cover to the album. Uh, this is the 30th anniversary edition, fully remastered. Uh, this came out in 2018, so that's obviously 30 years later. Track listing on the back. Love the uh, lament configuration uh, design there. It's always nice when they keep in theme. There are some tracks on here that aren't in the movie, too, so if that's a, a perk for you, a buying decision moment for you, you should definitely think about that. Comes in 2LP red with black smoke vinyl. Very nice. You got the front and, of course, the puzzle box. Because you got to have it. So Hellbound, Hellraiser 2. The tagline, time to play. Next up is Suspiria, 1977. This is directed by Dario Argento. I mentioned him previously. Uh, this is really his first foray into pure horror. I know he did Giallo films before this. Some people think his previous movie, Deep Red, is pure horror. I believe there's still a lot of Giallo elements in that film. But Suspiria really is where he dives full-blown into horror. You can argue with me in the comments if you like, but, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. So the gist of this movie is an American dancer goes to a German ballet school, ostensibly a German ballet school because there are all sorts of evil things lurking in this school. It's kind of a front in some respects, and uh, a bunch of grisly murders happen, and that's how the dancer is on her path to discovery of finding out just how evil this school is. And that's basically Suspiria. So I didn't actually rent this movie until I was an adult. Um, a lot of the 70s and 80s Italian horror movies weren't on my VHS rental shelves in the stores that I was going to. So I had to wait till I was an adult. So kind of a better late than never thing, I feel, though, because I love Italian horror of this era. I mean, Dario Argento is really just one of many directors. Um, love this genre dearly. I love Giallo films quite a bit, too. So there it is. So the soundtrack is weird, it's electronic, it's a bit proggy. We are talking about Goblin at this point. I mentioned them before, we're going to talk about them a little bit more now. Some creepiness and some otherworldly soundscapes thrown into the mix as well. It gets a little bit tribal at times, which is interesting. Um, I would say it's very Italian horror movie soundtrack sounding, but again, a lot of folks copied Goblin. So these are the originals. So here's the cover. Uh, this is the Cinevox pressing from 2016. There have been a ton of pressings of Suspiria over the years. There is an original from 1977 if you're looking for that and want to spend tons of money. Here's Gatefold. Something in Italian, something in Latin. Neither do I know. And, of course, the tracks. And, of course, the vinyl. Classic black with the Cinevox logo here. And same thing on the back. So Suspiria. Two taglines for this one. Do you know anything about witches? Is one. But the one we all know, of course, is the only thing more terrifying than the first 12 minutes of this film is the last 92. Sure. Next up is the first movie in my favorite horror franchise ever. This is Friday the 13th. Originally released in 1980. If you haven't seen this film, and God knows why you haven't, a group of camp counselors are picked off one by one by an unknown killer. And this is years after a child's drowning and a double murder that followed. 
and you're saying, who's the killer? Who could it be? And watch the damn movie. You'll find out. So, believe it or not, this is the very first horror movie I ever rented on VHS. This could be the very first movie I ever rented on VHS. So, back in the fall of 1982, my mom had gotten a VCR. Uh, we either bought the VCR or she got it on loan from the university she worked for. Not really sure. But we had a video rental store in this very small town in Utah I lived in. And I was really excited. It's funny because two years previous to this, in 1980 when the movie came out, I remembered the TV trailer really, really a lot. I remember the count off, one, two, three, and I was like so excited. I couldn't get in the theaters to actually see it. By this time in the early 80s, the theaters in town were basically not being really vigilant on not letting kids in the theaters. And I don't know why that happened on the drop of a dime back then. Maybe it's because slasher movies were so much more gruesome and all of that. I'm not even sure. But I rented this movie, was really excited about it, still excited about it to this day. So one thing I dig on the soundtrack is the use of stingers. Uh, those are those sharp sounds that connote surprise in a film. Um, and they go back in horror for decades. I mean, Bernard Herrmann, again, used them in Psycho. He did more of a sort of staccato stinger thing with the shower scene. We all know it. But uh, Manfredini uses strings to get that across, uh, the stinger sounds. I, I, I'm a sucker for them. I like them. I think they're effective, at least in the 1980s, before they were massively overdone. But... They still work in this movie. Of course, one track on this soundtrack that can go is Banjo Travelin', which is really what it sounds like. It's just a bunch of banjo playing. Um, it is in the movie. It's kind of early on in the film. It's kind of background music for the most part, but I hate it there. It, it, it breaks the soundtrack for me a bit. I think it's track two or three. It's early on in the soundtrack, so that can go. But otherwise, this is a great soundtrack. Uh, there is a bit of variation of a theme going on. Manfredini doesn't vary too, too much, but it still works. It's still Friday the 13th. So here's the cover. 2014, first time on vinyl. You are going to get one in 1980, obviously. I don't think Paramount wanted to spill the money for that. But here it is. Also, we have some liner notes here uh, from Harry Manfredini, as well as Sean Cunningham. Sean Cunningham is the director of the film, uh, talking about collaborating on the music in the movie. And, of course, the back cover with full track listings. There you go. And here's the vinyl. Uh, you can't see it very well. It looks kind of black here, but it is green with black smoke. They're also calling it uh, Crystal Lake Murky Green. Uh, it's limited edition, 180 gram, all of that. There's the labels with the cool Friday 13th logo. And I love the back with the bullseye, for those who know the scene. You also get a 12 by 12 art print in this edition of this soundtrack. Uh, Jackie Oakley is the artist. I don't know this person, but pretty cool. And just like pieces, there's also text etched into the run out of each side of this record. Uh, the first side says, ain't that cool? And the B side says, you guys are toast. Love it. So Friday the 13th, and you know the tagline, it's right up there. They were warned, they are doomed. And on Friday the 13th, Nothing will save them. Terribly true. Next up is Bram Stoker's Dracula from 1992. Uh, basic synopsis, Count Dracula, obviously, uh, longs for his lost love. And then he moves to England and meets a facsimile or reincarnation, take your pick. And they have that little thing going on. But also blood is consumed in mass quantities because vampires got to eat too. So there it is. So I likely saw this movie in the theaters when it came out. Uh, one thing I really like about this movie is the sort of dual appeal it has. I mean, on the one hand, you have this subplot with Dracula and his girlfriend, lovey-dovey romantic stuff. And then the other side, you got biting and killing and all the fun things that horror movies have. And what was interesting is back then, my girlfriend and I really loved this movie a lot, the girlfriend I had at the time. And I think it had different uh, appeals. But we got to watch it anyways. We both enjoyed it together. So there's that. It's an interesting movie in that regard. I don't mind all the lovey-dovey stuff. It's a good movie on its own. It doesn't drag it down for me. And the cool thing about the soundtrack is it really does capture that same dual appeal. I mean, the music is at times epic, but it's also sweeping and romantic, but it's also creepy and unsettling. And it all ties it together really, really well, just like the movie does. So it's nice to see when a soundtrack and a movie are very much playing on each other. There's a cover art with a familiar poster art that we all know from it. Uh, it is interesting that the logo and this design here are embossed, but they also have a spot varnish on them. Give it a nice glossy kind of thing going for it. 
And of course, back with pictures and track listings. Here's the vinyl. I love the classic Columbia labels here that they created for it. Um, this did come out in 2021 as an edition. There is an original 1992. This is not it. Um, 180 gram vinyl. I do love that there is run out text on this one too. Uh, the A side is there is much to be learned from beasts. And the B side is the blood is the life and it shall be mine. Great stuff. So Bram Stoker's Dracula. The tagline, the blood is life. Love never dies. Next up is a bit of a double feature. We're going to talk about Dracula, also known as Horror of Dracula in the United States, and The Curse of Frankenstein. This is a soundtrack that has both soundtracks in it. So we're going to talk about both movies and both of the scores. Uh, the movie synopsis, of course, uh, Dracula is basically a cat and mouse game between Count Dracula and Von Helsing and... Curse of Frankenstein is the same old story of the namesake creator and the creature he makes. We all know this. Classic stories. So it's likely I first saw both of these movies and movies like this on Creature Double Feature, which was a show every Saturday afternoon on Channel 56 in Boston. Uh, I lived in Worcester, Massachusetts, but Boston's TV stations were coming in, so that's what we watched. Um, Creature Double Feature was a pretty big deal to me as a kid. Uh, I watched especially from the late 70s to the mid-80s, and got tons of my early, early horror in, especially the gothic horror. It seemed that Creature Double Feature was very... Um, very big on playing gothic horror. They did a lot of Hammer films and AIP movies and stuff like that. So these two movies were definitely watched a whole lot. So starting with Dracula, there's definitely a very epic feel to the soundtrack. And I can't help but wonder if the folks, uh, Wojciech Kilar, uh, who was the composer for Bram Stoker's Dracula in the 90s, might have pulled a little bit from this soundtrack because it's epic in very much the same way and its instrumentation, its attack, its delivery, basically. So... There might have been a little bit of borrowing there. Curse of Frankenstein is is uh, not so bold. It's a little more laid back and a little creepier. Um, that makes sense considering the um, the monster, basically. So I like that they're both in the same package. They both complement each other in certain ways, but they're both classic Hammer films. Love this stuff. So here's the cover. Uh, you got Fra Dracula on one side and... There's Frankenstein on the other. Uh, this was a UK Record Store Day release. Uh, it came out in 2020. I did mention it in my 2020 Record Store Day video, but obviously I have to mention it here again. Uh, pretty cool. Um, it also has an insert here. Uh, Dracula, every track is talked about here, as well as the same thing for Frankenstein. This is a modern composer. Um, his name is Nick Rain, I believe. This isn't the James Bernard soundtrack strictly. This is a, uh, a re-performance of it, but still great stuff. Also, there is a gatefold I probably should show there with uh, more notes on Dracula and Curse of Frankenstein. So it's also cool as the records are differently colored. This is the red one for Dracula. Very nice. And of course, we have green for Frankenstein. Uh, this set is limited to 1,000 copies. So, Dracula, or Horror of Dracula for you U.S. kids, and The Curse of Frankenstein. Great double feature. Next up is Prom Night 1980, one of my favorite Canadian slashers. The premise is pretty simple. Four young kids accidentally kill their pal and then pretend they didn't see anything and weren't part of it. Six years later, an unknown killer comes and dispatches them all in very gruesome ways. Very awesome ways, I might add. So this was definitely a VHS rental for me in the 1980s, but I also saw it a bunch on, again, Channel 56, but this time on their evening movies. Uh, during the week and on the weekends, they had movies they had at 8 o'clock, but then they had movies at 10 o'clock. And the cool thing was their post-10 o'clock films weren't edited, so there was boobies and blood and all sorts of cool stuff. I don't know why that was. Maybe it was an FCC safe time and they felt they could get away with that. But very cool for a teenage me, as you could imagine. Of course, when I mention Prom Night, I always feel like I have to mention Terror Train as well. Both are Canadian slashers. Both have Jamie Lee Curtis. Both have a very similar feel and cinematography. So if you're looking for a double feature and you want to watch something with Prom Night, you should probably grab Terror Train as well. Wish I had the soundtrack to that. Don't think it exists. Let me know in the comments if it does, though, because I just haven't looked. 
As for the soundtrack, it is part score, but then part disco songs. And they were disco songs specifically written for this movie and for the prom scene in particular. Uh, You're going to find that the title track is really catchy and sing-alongy. It's a bit of an earworm. Trust me on that. So here's the edition I have, limited to 350 copies. This was a 2019 release, and it's very different from the 1981 soundtrack. Uh, There was a soundtrack that came out one year after the movie did. I believe it was only in Japan, and the tracks are slightly different. So this one definitely has the disco tracks as well as the score. Pretty cool. Also, I should show you the uh, the gatefold here. Uh, Lots of interesting um, mementos, uh, the names of the kids and... All sorts of in-references throughout the movie here. I love this. Someone did a lot of detail on this. Someone someone really loved Prom Night to go to this extent. And also more cool artwork and track listings. Vinyl here is blue, pink, and red splatter. What they're calling Disco Acid Flashback. Amazing name. And more of that great artwork from the jacket. Pretty cool. And what may or may not be even cooler is that this edition comes with a free condom. Yes, there is a condom in here. It is from the Department of Sex Ed at Hamilton High. Amazing. Also, the killers are coming. The killers are coming. And there is actually a condom in here. It is right there. Just in case you get lucky at the prom. So, prom night. And remember, if you're not back by midnight... You won't be coming home. Next up is Alien, 1979 classic sci-fi horror movie. Uh, This one is a spacecraft with seven crew members. uh, Discover a derelict alien vessel. They enter. They investigate. They find some pods. Inside the pods are creatures. They pop out. And everyone's killed in creative and savage ways. Great, right? So sadly, I never got to see this movie back in 1979. I was 11 years old. I couldn't get in the theaters. No one was going to take me. That's how it goes. I had to wait for this one later in the early 80s when VHS tapes and movie rentals were a thing. So that's my story. So the soundtrack has this very sweeping intro, and then it goes into more foreboding territory. There's some quieter passages, and then it just goes total frenzy in moments. It's very up and down. It's very all over the place. I like that about Alien because it's a very unpredictable movie, at least the first time you see it. And I like the soundtrack also is fairly unpredictable. Pretty cool stuff. So a very professional soundtrack. Of course, the composer is Jerry Goldsmith. We know Jerry Goldsmith well. He's done tons and tons of movie soundtracks. He hasn't done a lot of horror. I mean, he did the first three Omen movies. He did Poltergeist. He did Psycho 2. But not a lot more than that in the realm of horror. But... Still works out pretty well. Uh, He's got a great sense of the movie and what's going on and how to make music to it. So hats off to him. Here's the jacket cover. Uh, This is a 1987 reissue. This is also a UK pressing on Silva screen in classic black. And of course, the back with pictures and liner notes and treks. So alien. And we all know the tagline. Say it with me. In space, no one can hear you scream. Next up is Rosemary's Baby, 1968. Same year I was born, which means that Rosemary had her baby, and Mrs. Paradise had her baby. Now do I dig that? A little bit. So again, another VHS rental for me back in the 80s. Obviously, I couldn't see it in the womb. Uh, Really cool. I really love the character development in this movie the most. Um, People bitch about it dragging. It's too long. But I believe it needed to be that long because each character, each actor, plays a very unique character and keeps the story moving. I love every single character in this film. I mean, even Laura Louise and Dr. Shan and that Greek guy at the end. Love the characters in this movie. They really keep things moving, and who cares it's too long? It's not too long. You're crazy. As for the soundtrack, it really is all over the place. I mean, you start with this sort of sweet passage with a lullaby going on in it, and that gets revisited here and there. There are also some jazzy bits. There's a 60s pop song in there. There are these sort of chanty, discordant, evilly kind of moments. It kind of just goes up and down a whole lot. Uh, Chris Comita is the uh, composer. Pretty interesting uh, soundtrack in general. Uh, Very unique in some ways. Again, it's all over the place. Great stuff. I love it. 
So you should know that there are variations of this soundtrack. Rosemary's Baby came out in different editions. Uh, there was one that concentrates much more on the score. There's one that throws every single last thing in the movie into it. And then there's mine. I have the 1968 original, which I'm going to show you momentarily. But whichever edition you get, if you love this movie, you got to get the soundtrack. Of course, here's the jacket, 1968 original, as I said. This one's on Dot Records in association with Paramount Pictures. Uh, I got the cast here, Christopher Comita, I already mentioned. And the back has more of the same and some cool pictures and the track listings. The orchestra on this is conducted by a man named Dick Hazard. Dick Hazard is the most amazing name ever, in my opinion. Great stuff. And of course, quick look at the vinyl. Uh, this is on Classic Black, as it would be in 1968. Got the Dot Records logo there. Sadly, no evil messages in the runout. And you would think there'd be some, wouldn't you? So, Rosemary's Baby, one of my favorite movies ever. And of course, the tagline, pray for Rosemary's Baby. And those are 10 of my favorite horror soundtracks in my vinyl collection. Of course, I also want to hear from you. What are some of your favorite horror movies and your favorite horror movie soundtracks? Sometimes that can be different answers. Sometimes you like the soundtrack more than the movie or the movie more than the soundtrack. I want to hear all about that in the comments below. And if this is your first time watching this channel, hey, my name is Matt. I run the Accusation Network where I normally do metal vinyl collecting videos. Yeah, you should definitely check out my playlist. I do a bunch of different types of shows in and around metal vinyl collecting. I think you'll find something to dig there. In fact, you know what? I know you'll find something. And of course, since this is YouTube, I'm going to tell you, like, subscribe, and share. Three great ways to support my channel. Even King Diamond would tell you to do that, right? Also, I should mention to my regular viewers that in November, I will have a normal metal vinyl haul. So that'll be coming up. And in December, I'm going to do my usual non-metal vinyl haul for all the non-metal vinyl I bought in 2021. Soundtracks excluded, of course. So definitely stay tuned for that. And of course, thank you for watching. And I'll see you in the next video.